Okay, so let's, let's introduce this guy. Um, we obviously know each other. Uh, we do? Yeah. yeah uh, we do. Uh, actually, all three of us know each other well. We've all worked together. Um, we've seen him sweep. I've seen him sweeping the floors. Yes. He's a neat freak. Uh, and that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, Doug, you've been uh, do doing every job at Intelligentsia for about 16 years, is that right. correct? Right, 17 in October. 17 years in October. Uh, uh, everything from sweeping floors to collecting bills, running deliveries, uh, pointing out cobwebs, pointing out uh, <laughs> plastic wrap on pallets of coffee, which is, oh my God, don't even get the man started. Um, uh, currently is the co-CEO of Intelligentsia Coffee. Uh, roasters, uh, currently with eight, is nine. No, coffee seven. Bars. seven, seven. Seven, seven coffee bars uh, currently, with some more in the works I hear. Yes. And three roasting facilities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the man behind Intelligentsia Coffee, Doug Zell. So, I'm here today uh, to talk about the evolution of hospitality and coffee bars, which, you know, we've been around, like these gentlemen said, we've been around for 17 years, and I think it's, it's something that we're still trying to figure out. You know, I think as a company, we've made just about every mistake that we could have, maybe some twice, hopefully not three times, and uh, trying to figure out how this works, um, how to interact with our customers, has been interesting and challenging over the years. And I still feel like the model that most coffee bars use, it's, it's not really working that well. How, how, I, I'd love to see a show of hands that thinks, of, of those of you that think the interaction with the customer is exactly where you want it to be. One, good, Annie, good. <laughs> One, out of the whole room. I agree with you. I, I still think we're trying to find the right place. Um, so let's start with why am I dressed like this? I was warned by Stephen Morrissey, who's going to see this on a recording, that I should wear a t-shirt and jeans to look like you, I guess, or something, or shorts, or tattoos, or, or whatever it is. But I did some research and, and decided to dress like this. What, what, how did my research go? Well, I asked a few baristas, um, and actually some of you may have heard this story, and I'll protect the innocent on some of the places, um, how I should dress, and you know, I asked the men, and they said, well, you know, a jeans and a t-shirt's fine. You know, I mean, it's the Nordic barista crowd. I mean, they're Scandinavian, they're hip. You know, jeans and a t-shirt will be good. And then I, then I ask, proceed to ask, like, three smart, attractive women what would be the best thing to dress to make sure I had their attention. Every single one said, a really well-tailored suit. So guess which one I went with. Anyway, so. <laughs> A lot of that is about providing the right context. And I think for our customers, we have to provide the right context so we can deliver, I guess, the information, the coffee, in a way that hopefully they will understand it, receive it, and then become an ambassador for great coffee. So anyway, let's talk about the evolution of hospitality and coffee bars. We start with the 90s. French fries, right? Um, the model is really fast food. It was aprons and baseball hats, visors, bloated menus. Uh, here's a good one, 20 ounce drinks. Remember that, 20 ounce drinks? Blenders, that was the 90s. And I think that the, the, the hospitality that went along with that was really a fast food one. Um, the question wasn't like, well, how do you feel like this, this Bourbon varietal taste versus the Katura? It was, who's next in line? Right? So it was really, it was more of that mentality than anything that was dug in, meeting the customer, trying to make it more culinary. That was the 90s. That's, that's when we got started. And a lot of people aspired to have a similar, uh, you know, similar setup, something that was, was, was uh, resembling the national chain. Flash forward. 2003. Third wave. That's the year it was coined. I, I did, did some research and found out that that was the year it was coined. So we went from French fries to third wave. Well, third wave had, had its good, good, good elements and its bad elements. I think that the third wave got into this 
fussiness for the sake of fussiness. I mean, I remember people coming into our coffee bars, and I'm sure you did that, you know, the people would come up and they drink the coffee and they'd go over in the corner and be like, this sucks. You know? I mean, they, 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 they tell you about how bad the coffee was, maybe it was under-extracted, over-extracted. There was all of this, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, you know, making the coffee, you know, like, okay, is he, is he gonna pull the shot? Is it coming? Is it coming sometime soon? You know, weigh it, right? Okay, and then you get it, not that good, right? You know, and, but, it, but it, was, it was incredibly fussy, and it set up this barrier, I think, between the barista and the customer uh, in a way that I still feel like we're trying to break down. And I get that people want to feel important and competent in their job, which is good. I mean, I think that that makes you know, baristas more comfortable. But it became this, it sort of, it, it became this customer as more of the enemy. Um, I know about coffee. I'm lucky I know about it. You don't. Um, you, you need to listen to me. You know, and even if you don't want to, you need to listen to me because I'm the barista and I know. Um, and it didn't, it didn't work all that well. And I also think a lot of it had to do with the, the rise of the internet. Okay, that makes me sound, the rise of the internet, I remember that. Makes me sound very old. Um, but what I think the internet did in that period, and then it was blogs, it was a few uh, you know, bulletin boards, whatever, th those kind of things. I feel like what the internet did is, is it made a person who may not necessarily have had a voice, have a voice, and as a result, based on what they perceive to be this global community of many, many people, including supposedly their customers, which usually it was, it was usually you know, all of us and maybe our mom on there you know, talking about coffee, so we thought that it meant that the world was listening to our message, and that's why, as baristas, you, Mr. Customer, Ms. Customer should be listening to us. So, to me, the third wave, um, you know, again, rise of the internet, and I think interaction between humans began to diminish. Um, I actually think that it, the, I, I feel like the internet's great, we get lots of information on it, but I also think the negative, negative part about it is that we, we, be, we begin to lose uh, human contact um, in a way that we, we adore. I mean, I think that the reason we go to coffee bars, and, and when I sit at one of, one of our coffee bars or one of my other favorite coffee bars, um, the idea of being out there and alone doesn't make a lot of sense. I go there because I want human interaction. Um, and I think that a lot of what the internet has done is taken that away. We're, we're, doing, we're, we're doing this. I mean, I was guilty of this last night. I was out at dinner, I'm you know, doing this. Why? You know, we should be there. Um, we should be there with our customers. We should be there with our friends interacting directly. Okay, so what came next after third wave? Um, I didn't have a, a I called 2007 uh, the era of affected influence. Also, wow, uh, antlers and mustaches, okay, right? Everybody remembers antlers and mustaches. It's sort of, it's kind of on its, it's falling, it's, it's on its downfall now. Um, social media really enters the picture in a meaningful way, 2007. Uh, this is Twitter, it's Facebook. Um, it's things that suck you into the vortex. And actually, uh, there was recently an article in, in the Atlantic that really talked about how a lot of social media, um, particularly Facebook, actually is making people lonelier um, because they're becoming more and more involved in this alternative life reality universe versus being here. Um, and I think that, again, in, in, another, in an even bigger way, you know, and, and as we're checking our Instagram to see how many people have liked our picture, um, in an even bigger way, it's, it, 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 it's draw, drawing us farther, again, a, away from interaction um, with humans, with each other. And I think in, in many ways, it, it even fostered a greater sense of isolation and a greater sense of standoffishness and contributed nothing to hospitality. In fact, I think it negatively affected it um, because to me, great hospitality should be like sitting in a friend's home at a dinner party or, you know, or sitting around having a cocktail. Um, so the era of affected influence Influence, 2007, um, I think it made the world feel smaller and again made people, perhaps the barista, feel more important because they were interacting in a world of their friends and everybody knew each other, but as it was facing the customer, I don't think it became any more intimate. I don't think it provided any basis for a better customer experience. Um, so, then we moved on to 2009. I call it the era of professionalism, okay? This is one of our coffee bars, and yes, I'm dressed sort of like that guy. Um, 
This is really when we moved into the era of deciding that, hey, you know, maybe what we need to do is we need to change the costume a little bit, you know, change the uniform. And perhaps this is what will get our customers to understand what great coffee is about. Because at least we're changing some of the context. We're saying, hey, this is more professional. Hey, we understand about coffee because I'm dressed a little bit better. And actually, I feel like this is when the media started to notice more of what was going on. When you saw more professionally dressed baristas uh, taking it as a craft. Um, and I also feel in 2009, there was a, a more polished presentation, a bit more welcoming, a bit more understanding because the fussiness of the third wave and the, this stuff and oh my God, what's, you know, people going into the corner talking about the coffee. I think what happened was a generation of us, and yes, you're younger than me, but a generation of us began to grow up. And we said, oh my God, all this fussiness, all this stuff, it's so exhausting. I mean, and if it's exhausting for us, imagine how our customers feel. They gotta be like, what, what, are, what are all these people doing? I mean, they're sitting there chattering about the coffee back there, but I, they're, I'm, not, I'm not being welcomed into the conversation. I, I don't know much about it. Um, but I think that in 2009, I, I feel like, and, and I don't know if the rest of you do, it was a turning point in that there was the beginning of the public becoming interested in coffee as a culinary beverage in a meaningful way. Um, it was a kind of thing because you know, the, the by the cup brewing became a little bit more theatrical. Like, well, what are you doing? They, they, they sort of, they, they got drawn into the conversation in a way that, that they hadn't before. And that was only three years ago, uh, which of course means we have a long way to go. So now we're in 2012. And I guess I'm suggesting that we're getting, we're getting closer. Um, and I'm going to propose something that's radical and potentially insulting, uh, which is so unlike me, right? Um, anyway, uh, suggesting a new model and a, a different way of looking at how we perceive the customer, because I think that's where it starts. I was having a conversation, where are you, Tim? Williams, up there on the camera. Um, we had a conversation last night at dinner, and it went something like this. Uh, now, if you're really nice to the customer, even if the customer is a difficult customer, and why is it that we were talking about hospitality training, and, and they train you for like dealing with the difficult customer, right? I mean, that's what they train you with. So why is it that we start with getting you ready for the difficult customer? It seems preposterous. It seems like the context is wrong. It'd be like if your whole life you were spent, if your whole education, your life, you spent it trying to figure out how to deal with a difficult person versus trying to figure out actually how to meet them in a place where they decide not to be difficult because it seems silly on their part. And he was talking about his experience actually at the Whole Foods in, uh, in Venice, California, where you go in. He's like, you know, I was having a bad day. I really, really wanted to not like them. And they were all so nice to me that I didn't know what to do. And, and I actually think that that is a good model um, and something that we should be considering. So what I'm suggesting as a radical proposition is that we think about our interactions with our customers more like with these guys. Okay? And I'm not saying to be insulting to, to anyone's intelligence, just to clarify. This is my dog, Otto, okay? How many of you have dogs or cats in the audience? Okay, how glad are you to see them every single time you come in the door? Right? Okay, if it's your cat or your dog, you're like, you know, I'm like, hey, buddy, what's going on? You know, I mean, regardless, if, if you had the worst day possible, right? I mean, just a terrible day, he's glad to see you, or your kitty's glad to see you, or they're hungry, um, <laughs> right? But, but what I'm suggesting is that if we thought about our customers in the way that we consider our pets, I know, strange, right? Um, it could really change things, and, and here's why. Um, one thing about dogs that you should know that's different than wolves is we selected them over time. Uh, we bred them to like us. And what dogs do that's very different than wolves and most other animals is they actually, they look at your eyes to gauge your intent, to see how you're feeling. And how many of you have been into the coffee bar where the barista's just looking down, you know, doesn't engage you at all, doesn't see how your day is going, isn't interested? Dogs don't do that. They, they want to see how you're doing. And I think that it creates a bond. I mean, looking people in the eye, gauging their intent, seeing how their, day, how their day is going, creates the right kind of bond. And I think that our dogs and cats know the deal. I mean, we feed them, right? 
So we provide them with sustenance. We walk them, or they walk themselves. We pick up their poop, for God's sakes. We provide the right environment so they can feel safe and loved and learn what we expect of them. And in general, we look after them and make sure they're well, they're well taken care of, right? I mean, think about, so think about your customers, right? I mean, think about if, if you did the same thing for everybody that walked in the door of your coffee bar. If you actually were genuinely interested in their well-being, if you provided the right environment so they felt safe, comfortable, happy, do you think that they would be more ready to listen to you if you wanted to talk about how great coffee can be and why it should be this marvelous culinary product? I would say, suggest yes. So, and so what do, what do these guys do in exchange for what we give them? I mean, we have this deal with them. Well, they comfort us, right? Okay, think about customers again. Here's a big one. They are loyal, right? I mean, you have a bad day, you've been good to this guy for a year, you know the routine, he gives a, they give us their loyalty. And I think that's something we want from our customers. They protect us, okay? Dogs, well, I don't know about cats. Maybe you have a big cat, but. Um, but our customers also protect us. I think that they, 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 they are advocates of what we're doing if we're doing a great job. Well, dogs lower our, our, blood, our blood pressure, um, you know, when we pet them. So I actually think we're getting a good deal. And they become part of our family. I mean, think about that. You know, I mean, there's pictures of you and your, your, you know, your baby and your wife or your husband or your significant other, and then there's the dog in the picture or the cat. You know, it's, they're part of our family. Again, think about customers in that context, that you want to make them part of the family of your coffee bar. They make us think life is good, right? I mean, I, I was saying to somebody, imagine if instead of that lineup out the door of customers that seem snarling, that it was like 20 of these guys, a few kitties, right? You'd be like, hey, buddy, you know, I mean, like, what do you need? You know, it, it would be very different than like, oh, great, there's that guy again. I, I really think if we change the context to thinking of it more like this, it would actually put us in the right mood to interact with our customers. And ultimately, these guys make us happy. Uh, and I think actually we need to figure out a way that our engagement with our customer makes us happy. Uh, I actually think that in the deal between dogs and cats and their owners, we benefit way more from the deal. Um, they could take us or leave us. I mean, they have loyalty. They could probably go out and, and hunt for themselves, etc. But I think that the deal benefits us. It, it's proven. People that have pets, lower, lower blood pressure, longer lifespan, all these things. I think that if we could find a way to interact with our customers that made us happy, it could actually be really good for us instead of stressful. Okay, so another thing that I, I feel like I've learned from my dog is you try and pick this thing up with your dog, if your dog's a smart dog or a cat, all over you in about three seconds. You know, a customer, I mean, how many times do we have to change the music at the coffee bar, really? I mean, how many times do we have to change the, the music? What, what are you doing? What are you doing? Look at me, look at me, I'm the customer, look at me, interact with me, I'm here. And I think that these guys won't let you get away with it. I mean, my 10-year-old daughter is like, Daddy, get off the phone. He's like three seconds, and he's all over me. You know, like, what's going on? So I, I think that dogs live in the here and now, in the present. And this is why I think the whole social media piece is dangerous. And we're so sucked into it and so sucked into the vortex of it that we could all be sitting across from the table from each other or at a coffee bar, and we're in our phones instead of being present. And I think for our customers, that makes them feel like we're not paying attention to them. We, we need to be present. Um, and these guys teach us to be present. So as part of the deal, how am I doing on time? Good, perfect, excellent. Um, I had a really good picture of him outside of the coffee bar uh, in the cold Chicago with snow around him. We shouldn't leave him out in the cold, OK? We shouldn't leave our customers out in the cold. When we turn our back on, on them, on him especially, uh, the dogs that are, are hurting dogs, uh, they'll bite you, nip at your heels. Shouldn't turn our backs on our customers. We should be paying attention to them when they're there. So it's funny, we, we actually, they train us as much as we train them. I know when he has to go outside. I think that once you get to know your customers, you're gonna know what their drinks are, you're gonna actually sort of train each other and have that same kind of deal. So 
ultimately, if we look our customers in the eyes to gauge their intent, we greet them vigorously, like we do when we see these guys. We're excited to see them every single time they show up. And we give them as much or as little attention as they want. We create an environment where they feel safe and loved and have the ability to learn in that safe, comfortable environment. Um, we actually may get them to do a few new tricks, you know? Uh, like say they, you know, like they want to learn about coffee, like they're, they're going to spend some time learning about coffee. And we may build some great loyalty. I think ultimately, what we want to do is this, and this is what we have with Doug, is create a lasting relationship based on voluntary mutual interdependence. I know at our coffee bars, about 80% of the people come every single day. So, you know, whether they're there because of their caffeine addiction or they like how it tastes, et cetera, they're there almost every day, and voluntarily, and we're taking their money, and mostly they're happy to be there. Uh, so I think that if we create an interaction that can be like it is with our pets, we can create this. Um, we can create a much more engaged customer base. Uh, people that are happy to be there every day, and actually people that are willing to learn about coffee in the way you want to teach about coffee, and actually they'll be incredible ambassadors about coffee. Um, because they're going to come into your place of business and every time they're going to love the experience and they're going to feel loved. Um, so, I suggest thinking about this when you see them, or your kitty, um, which I realize is a little crazy, but I think could really change how we interact with our customers. And, again, the reason I dress like this is to create the right context and environment. So I, you should also be thinking about doing that when you build out your coffee bar or when you are putting it together. So create the right environment to sort of to build this as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. All right, and three extra minutes. Questions? Yes. Hi, how you going? Um, I just want to play a little bit of devil's advocate, if sure. that's okay. Great. Um, I was just wondering, do you think that there is a lifespan on how long you can actually spend in the service industry? Mm. You mean as a, as a barista? Yeah, I mean like working on the bar, I mean like standing up all day, I mean like greeting customers, yeah, yeah, lifespan on that. I think to answer the question, it depends on how good we are at evolving what we do, okay? Um, I also think that it begs a bigger economic question. It depends on how much we can charge for coffee, because ultimately your question revolves around how much can I get paid to do this. It doesn't? Right. 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 I think I think I would an I would say that I think it's viable if what you do is energizing and that the the industry and what we do continues to evolve. So I think that if it moves more to a model where we are getting the right prices per cup and we do I think that the purpose of what we do beyond selling stuff should be to create curiosity, um, which to me is always what a great education does. Um, it's not you know test for the sake of taking tests, but but I think when we we actually connect with our customers and create curiosity about coffee, then there's an opportunity for lifelong learning. And I think if we can do that, then the job that you do and the format of what it is that we do will, will change dramatically. Um, so that it will become, there will be much more of like a teaching environment. And I actually think that, if we can move towards that, and we can move towards where the pricing model supports that, then it will be a lifelong endeavor. Because it might not just be standing behind the bar making, making coffee, it may be, giving talks about coffee where then you sell a pound at the end. I mean, there needs to be an eco economic piece of it that works, but I think the model will look very different 15 years from now if we're successful and we have everybody doing what you say you're doing. I mean, it will change completely because I think people that 
come and get coffee won't, will no longer look at as function, a functional beverage, you know, and, because I think there's still a, a portion that does. Um, it, it will be much more like, sorry, Oliver, buying a bottle of wine and, fe and feeling like, oh gosh, well tell me more about this. Let's talk about bio biodynamic practices. Um, it will be, become a much more engaging, lo long lasting conversation. So I think it kind of depends on what we do. I'm hopeful that it changes and evolves because that would make it much more interesting. Well, but, 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 right, 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 but maybe, but maybe it's not on your feet, maybe it's some other, you know, der manifestation, derivation of that, so. Other questions? Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, how do you, um, culturally, how do you uh, incentivize baristas, or how do you create a culture that rewards that type of customer service uh, and not create, like, just silos or individuals? Good question. Um, pay people well, it's part of it. Um, have a, a rigorous training program that values education and thoughtfulness. Um, I think that something I'm really pleased that I see at our coffee bars and other coffee bars of, of great value um, is that if you go into a coffee bar that's actually really working well, where they're dug in on the coffee, you, at, you see the baristas learning for the sake of learning and the curiosity is being created by themselves. I mean, onto themselves. So it's not just because we said, you gotta learn this. There's actual learning that they're taking on themselves to learn more about coffee. So I think there's a cultural piece. You have to create the right environment so that it's okay for them to learn outside of, here's the guidebook, you know? That you, you say, hey, there's, there's more res resources out there. And, and this is the kind of company you were hired. This was, you were screened, we, you know, we were rigorous about our interviewing process, and I think part of it's really hiring well, also. Um, you're here because we, here's what we expect, and we expect a lot. We expect the stores to be busy, we expect to be a part of it, we expect you to contribute, and then it starts to foster this environment of high expectation, and also of, of the, the decision on the parts of the barista to actually continuously learn more about coffee because they want to, not because they're gonna be tested because we said so. Um, I think that also, and this is a, a sort of a, a more of a business question. The, there was a point in the history of, of trajectory of my company that we decided that it was important to grow instead of being a single coffee bar because we wanted to create uh, a career path for people that wanted to continue to grow. And you know, whether it was economically or they had curiosity. Um, so that's always a tough call because some people just want to keep it real small. Um, so you, it's really about fostering that environment and honestly you just got to keep supporting it. I think it's, you know, it's like a, I have a 10-year-old daughter and she's interested in the arts. It's like, well, let's get behind that then. Let's, let, let's support it. And let's support it with our actions, not just our words. And I think that it, it requires effort on the part of management and ownership to foster that. And it, it just, it can't just be about a P&L. I think it's got to be about building a culture that embraces learning. Doug, I have a quick question for you. Um, there were occasions when I was looking at Otto at what? At Otto, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, Let's put him back up there. Yeah, thank you. Aw, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> and, and it feels to me like there are moments when you were talking about our customers being the dog. Right. There also seemed to me there were moments when you were actually thinking that the barista's the dog. Right. And so do you think it's a sort of a doggy relationship that we've got going on here? <laughs> well, well, actually, no, no. What's a, honestly, what's very interesting, and there's, there's a great book out now, uh, a New York Times bestseller that talks about dogs. And I actually saw it this morning out on the run. I mean, no, no, actually, it was yesterday on the run. I mean, Great Dane, right, huge Great Dane, and this tiny little, like, chihuahua. And they're both interacting. I mean, they don't, they see each other as equals. They, I mean, they notice each other's size, and they're respectful of it. But they see each other as equals. So to that light, I think the answer should be yes. I mean, I think, I think that... Um, is the barista the chihuahua or the, or the Great Dane? <laughs> I'll leave that one to you to answer. Um, but, but no, I, I think that, uh, again, this whole conversation about the difficult customer, to me that's like preposterous. Like, so we're preparing mentally, we're bracing for this difficult customer. And like, let's, let's you know, focus all the training around the difficult customer. I mean, it's preposterous, because one out of however many, whatever, a thousand people are difficult. But I actually think if you meet those folks head on and see them eye to eye, they can be disarmed if you're treating everyone, you know, with kindness and respect and the excitement, again, that when you see your, your puppy or your kitty um, <laughs> would work well. 
Other questions? Hey, Doug, you mentioned uh, the, the skill, uh, honing the skill of determining how much or how little attention each customer wants. Right. If there is a customer that requires a lot of attention, mm -hmm. uh, under traditional staffing in, in, a, in a coffee bar setting, right. that could be difficult Correct. Uh, yes. in order to move the queue. Are you suggesting a different model in staffing a coffee bar to accommodate that? Well, I think that yes, if it's possible. Um, again, I think that the economics, you know, as a business owner, the economics have to make sense too. Uh, and I think some of those folks don't understand that the line is like getting longer and longer and longer behind them. Um, so some of the, you know, I, I think that you may have to say, you know what, I really want to talk to you about this, but now it's, it's tough. Um, if you could come back and like, you know, give me a time when you can come back and we can talk about this. If you really want to know about, you know, all of the, the varietals planted in Colombia and, you know, what the soil looks like, we, we, could prob we probably shouldn't be doing that at, at 8.15 on a Tuesday morning in Chicago. Um, not the best time. So I think if you can be kind about it, I think you can get them to come back. I think ultimately if the economics can change and we can get more per cup, per pound, I, I do think having a model that you know, has a slow bar, if you will, um, has classes would be great. I'm hoping that that's where we can get to, but our customers need to be part of this, that solution. You know? They need to be willing to pay a little bit more to get that. Um, I don't think we're that far away. I think we're going to be able to see more of it in the next five years if we continue to do the right thing. Question? Yeah, um, I've got a question relevant to what you were saying about the customers paying the right price. Yes. Um, obviously, economy is quite a big issue. Um, and with the spike last year of the, the C grade, right. um, my question is basically, do you think we're charging the right price for coffee? And do you think the customer um, are sort of ready to, to perhaps pay a little bit more um, so they get the professional um, yeah. service? I would say that, um, are we charging the right price? I think we could charge more. Um, I think some of it, again, is, is, is because we have the wrong context. I mean, I, I went out and had a, a beer or two last night. And uh, whether that beer cost me, and, and let's be honest, our target market is us. It's people like us. You know, uh, it's people that have a, li you know, a little bit more money um, because they're spending discretionary income on coffee. But if that person spends $3 for a cup or $5 for a cup, it really doesn't matter to them. It really doesn't. Because they should, just like that beer, if it's six or eight, I'm like, oh, I really want that one. I'm like, oh, it's eight, forget it. I'm going to get the $8 beer that I wanted or the, the, the $11 glass of wine. But we're, we're so worried that, that, like, that's a doubling in price. Well, you know what, it's $2 or, or you know, whatever it is, a dollar and one and a half euros. I, I think that we need to present it boldly in the right context. See, that's the other thing too, is if you go, if you still have the overhead menus that look like fast food, then people expect the coffee to be $1.75. But if you have what looks like a seasonal menu that changes and the, the choices are laid out in a way that presents it as something of value, and instead of it, you know, you know it's like at our coffee bars, you get a bamboo tray, you get a, a, a carafe, and you get your cup. So it looks like it's more, you know, the presentation is there. So somebody's willing to pay five dollars because they're like, oh, this is cool, you know. And, and again, to them, if they spend two more dollars a day, honestly, it's in the course of a year, it's, you know, what is it, seven hundred and twenty-eight dollars, or it's nothing to them. I mean, I, I think that to get what they really want and have them have it make them really happy, it's 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 a few few dinners out to get exactly what you want every day for for your cup of coffee. But I think we can't hedge the bet. We have to like be all in, um, otherwise they, they know that you're hedging, you know. Well, we're still gonna do the brewed coffee for $1.75, and then we also have this other thing over here, and it hurts a little bit at the beginning if you have to make that transformation, um, but it's funny because I think we have wholesale customers, and, and they may be lower volume, say a couple hundred transactions. Those are absolutely the places that should brew everything by the cup. Don't throw anything out, don't charge a dollar. Why would you wanna be less expensive than Starbucks? I mean, is that, what, is it, what does that signal to the customer? Hey, we're less and we have fewer people in here. I mean, it's not like, oh gosh, let's go there. Um, so I think you want to deliver a distinctive experience that is worth the price you're charging. You know, and, and, and I think we can t continue to push the prices up. And then the re remuneration to the producers can be appropriate. I mean, I, the beauty of wine is if the bottle costs $20, then the restaurant sells it for 40. If the bottle costs 40, then they sell for 80. And there's a market for all of those things. The coffee still is, is getting there. I mean, I think ultimately we'll land there. Question? Yes. 
So I love my customers, but what I think is difficult uh -huh. is when the customer doesn't or can't separate not getting what you want uh -huh. and bad service. I see. If you come to me and order an espresso takeaway, I can't do that because right. my boss said I can't. Right. And I'm saying in the nicest way, sorry, can you do you have the time to enjoy right. it here or here are my AirPress option and I'm I'm being kind and I right. have people running and screaming out the door because they didn't get that espresso to take away. Right. And then so they get, how then do get on, they get on Yelp them to be yeah. kind? <laughs> they don't have Yelp here, do they? No, thank Good. God. Thank God. <laughs> Everyone's a food critic. I don't know how you become qualified to be a food critic, but I want that job. Um, no, I, I think that, that, that that's the one that sort of stands out as, as symbolic of the challenge of the industry. Um, I think that in those cases, it's a tough call because I actually suspect that if you were to meet that customer where they're at initially, that eventually you would convince them that they were wrong. Um, but you have to be patient enough to do it. Does that mean you should have like chewing gum and burritos on your menu? No. But I think that um, unless we have the opportunity, like that person never engages with you because they're just like, forget it. And then they're going to go somewhere else, which means you've actually completely lost the opportunity to change their mind. So I actually feel like it may be better to give customers what they want with, you know what, and then come back after, you know, come back when it's slower. I, what I want to do is I want to pull you a shot in ceramic and I want to do it in paper. Let's, let's do a taste test. Just, it's on me. Let's do that. Um, I, I feel like the person that's even drinking espresso, even if it's in a to-go cup, they've become more daring than the person that was drinking the mocha, the whatever. And they actually may be the kind of customer you do want to engage, because or else they're looking at it as a caffeine delivery system, they think espresso is the best way to deliver that. Um, so you could have all sorts of other conversations. I don't know, I feel like we should, in this era, try and meet them more where they're at, and then push on them. You know, get them inside the tent, say, come on, come on in, all right. I'll play your game for a little while, you know? It's sort of like, you know, with him, it's like, he's like, I'm not gonna roll over unless you bring the treat out, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it, you know? So, I'm like, come on, roll over it. I'm like, I know you can do this, because I try and demonstrate it to my friends, and then he's just like, you know, and then I go for the treats, and he's, he's already rolled over then, he knows. So, so I, th I think, you, I think in, you know, meet them more where they're at, and then, and then push. Because I think the challenge that we face, and, and something that Apple has done really, really well, is they've created products that we never thought we needed, and now we can't live without. So I think, you know, but they've always sort of said, come here, you, you got to see this. Or, look at this thing. And, and I feel like if we can get them inside the tent, they're going to have more of an opportunity to do that. Questions? Uh, this will probably have to be the last question. <laughs> can I ask two things? Um, <laughs> I actually have two unrelated questions, so you can just answer one if that's works better for time-wise. Um, in your talk, you talked a lot conceptually, and now in the questions, you've gotten a little more concrete about mm. ways to create a certain environment in, in a coffee shop, and, and you've designed a lot. I was wondering if you could say something more about that, because um, for a lot of people, I think this role of, of teacher or educator can mm. feel too kind of top-down. So I was uh -huh. wondering if you could say something about ways to create a space um, without saying anything. That, that, commu that communicates a certain message that this coffee mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. is different and then mm -hmm. hence worth more. Totally unrelated um, question. Your shops are mostly in, in large cities. Correct. Larger cities, and I'm wondering if you can say anything about um, different circumstances offering this kind of coffee in a major metropolis versus trying to bring this into uh -huh. a much smaller market, which Starbucks has been able to do, charge you know, $5 for right. terrible coffee you know, in a small coastal town. And I'm wondering if, if you have any it's ideas about ways town. of doing that, or if, is this a market that's really specific to somewhere big? Um, is this a, a product that's really specific to a certain l large market? So two different questions. Why, why, why are you raising your hand so vigorously for? You want to comment? I have a lot of questions. Oh. I, I, I'll, I'll answer. Yeah, of course. Let, let me answer it from a from a from a, a coffee bar perspective. I think that that design has become a much more important element in coffee bars than it used to be. Because a lot of stuff used to be like do it yourself kind of look. I feel like what you should be doing is building a palace to coffee. For lack, I mean, that doesn't mean ornate or anything like that. But that the focus is is truly on coffee. And I think we've done a lot better job in communicating that with our customers with lower counter heights um, and the kind of service we're providing. But I, I really feel like it should, when you walk in, it should be instantaneously obvious to the most casual observer that they're not walking into a fast food restaurant, that it is something different, that it is a palace of coffee. 
um, that design was considered so that the experience could be something very, very different. Um, so does that answer that question or no? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that to me, um, having information out is good. It shouldn't be overwhelming. There shouldn't be a ton of signage because to me, lots of signage is sort of, oh my God, what do I look at? Um, but I think it is having things like tastings um, and, and taking these things seriously so you're communicating to your customer that you're actually, you're taking this coffee thing uh, seriously. As far as the major, uh, big markets versus small markets, yes, we have actively gone into bigger markets because I think there is a more um, early adopter, to use market speak, kind of audience than there might be in smaller towns. However, I would, I would contend that in, in like university towns, um, places like, you know, Madison, Wisconsin, Berkeley, California, uh, Athens, Georgia, my suspicion is there's also an audience um, because I, I think that the, the demographic is that would be interested in all this is one that has probably traveled, um, one that has, you know, seen a little bit of the world, one that likes, you know, different ethnic foods, all that stuff. I think those, those folks are typically more game to be interested in learning about stuff because they're already interested in learning about stuff. Um, and not to disparage small towns, I mean, I think that the, the good news is in small towns, at least across the United States, where it used to be the corner tavern, uh, and my suspicion is in, in you know, other places like the local pub, is now there's a, coffee, there's a coffee house in like the smallest farm town in rural fill in the blank in the United States now. So it's moving that direction, which means about 15 years from now, um, though those places will be ready for a more sort of higher end experience is my suspicion. Because now those places are drinking microbrewery beer when they hadn't before. I mean, th there is an evolution there. And Sorry. Yeah, um, to the question. You seem like just, a smart guy. Just as a customer's perspective, um, I've been hearing a lot about Intelligentsia and their coffee shops and it was uh, mid last year and um, I went to Venice Beach and I had a meeting there and rocked up and I've just been listening to what Doug and all the questions have been about and um, something Doug's talked about with the dog and when you walk into Intelligentsia, um, the one thing you get is humility and um, anyone that knows me personally knows I know very little about coffee and um, on it. Um, <laughs> but um, the one thing I do appreciate is um, the amazing knowledge and um, wealth of experience in the room and it doesn't matter where I go and events and you know the real way to do the value equation is for you guys to find ways to actually make the customers feel that you're very humble and you're passing on because the more you can actually do that the more customers you're going to be able to appeal to and the faster the value equ equation will grow but when getting to Venice Beach it's really simple you know I'm lining up and um, I'm at their store, I'm thinking, why am I lining up? So you're mixing with all these people and you're finally making your way to the counter and their shop's set up beautifully, but very simple and it has all the major details. But as soon as you get to the point where you'll either go to the left or to the right to the barista and they will engage you and invite you what you're after, you already feel that you're in a place that knows what they're doing. And um, it's very humble, so you, they'll ask you for what coffee you're after, um, obviously, as a customer, you'll respond, and while you're waiting, there's the opportunity to talk to them. They'll tell you what they're doing. You can ask questions. So already that knowledge and exchange um, happens while you're waiting. And you know, somehow, however they're training their baristas, um, they're kind of like um, ringmasters in a circus. They're entertaining. They're talking, and you know, they're either lifting up the amount of knowledge they're exchanging with the customer, or they're making it personal. And then you walk off with the finishing touches or a takeaway coffee and the place is packed. And I know it's in a great location, but they're extremely busy, but they keep on delivering um, the doggy experience and making people feel special why they, um, they create an image and, you know, a very good image that they are knowledgeable, but um, there's an element of humility there. And seriously, Doug, I'm just... A general customer and you know thank you you've done a good job and and it's something that really is um oh i've got to get off the thing is <laughs> i'm done i'm out thank you thank you, thank you doug